will and his way in our life. Yeah. Uh, open your Bible today, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And here in this portion of Scripture, we have Hezekiah taking the throne and coming in and making some changes to make sure that everything is in accordance with the Word of God. And we're going to pick it up in verse 10. And the Bible says, now it is in mine heart. That's where things start, folks, by the way. It's got to be in your heart. If it's going to have any lasting effect, it's got to be in your heart first. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. The Bible then says, then the Levites arose. And I just want to pause there for a moment to make a point. Why does it say, then the Levites arose? Those were, those were the Green Beret. Those were the special forces. Those were your seals. Those were the guys that were best trained. And notice it says immediately as the king conveyed this information, it says, then the Levites arose. And you know, those of you that have been saved in this church for any length of time, your pastor is going to need to be able to lean on you more so than someone that just got saved last month. Amen. Those of you that are older in the Lord should know better, should be stronger, should be able to be counted on even more so than those that are young in the Lord. So when you say, you know, we should split up the responsibilities evenly. Really? Would you put the same amount of responsibility on a two-year-old that you would on a teenager? Mm -hmm. See, yeah. if you're older in the Lord, more should be required of you. Mm -hmm. Remember when the woman was taken in adultery and Jesus wrote on the ground, basically let he who was without sin cast the first stone? And it says, beginning at the eldest, they got up and walked away. Why? Because those that were older in the Lord knew better. They were more mature. They understood what the Lord was trying to say. Whereas a newborn babe in Christ might not get it right away. And that's why those of you that are older in the Lord, that have been here for any length of time, that have been under the teaching and preaching of God's word and have strengthened yourself, more should be required of you. Mm -hmm. Your pastor should be able to lean more so on you than on others. All right, now pick, let's pick it up in verse 15 there, our second Chronicles 29. It says, And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to uh, the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kidron. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Father, we thank you for the day. And pray, Father, that you'd use me now. Uh, God, uh, I just I surrender my heart, my, my mind, the Lord, uh, everything. My mouth, uh, God, I just want it to be used by you. I want it to bring you honor and glory. I pray, Lord, to be a blessing to your people. And God, that uh, at the end of it all, you receive the honor glory and the praise for everything said and done. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. Amen. So in my studies, I kept coming across this term, the Brook Kidron, and wanted to know exactly what it meant. So I started to study it out. And I, I found out that the Brook, uh, Brook Kidron was actually defined as a gloomy, dark brook. Um, and it was named so because it's where they carried all the animal sacrifices to. Mm. After they were sacrificed, they would take them to the brook Kidron, throw them in the brook, and all along the riverbed on the banks, it was all blood stained, red blood stained. Because, you know, when they sacrificed, they, sometimes they sacrificed a thousand sheep or a thousand cats. Can you imagine all the blood? And that's where they threw it into the brook Kidron. It was more commonly known as the, the sewer, the, the city sewer, than it was a brook. 
And it means darkness, turbulence, great agitation, and great evil. But it was a torrential waterway. It wasn't a little rippling brook. It was torrential water, kind of like Niagara Falls type stuff. And you know, why was it so torrential? Because it was only 20 miles long. It started north of Jerusalem, past the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, en route to the Dead Sea. And that's a good place for it to end up, all that garbage and refuse and the guts, the skin, everything that they didn't use, all got thrown into the brook, all that blood. But in that 20 miles long, that thing dropped 3,912 feet in 20 miles. you got to imagine that water was moving. That's why they chose it. Why? Because we want to wash the filth away. We want the filth to be gone. We want it out of arm's reach. We don't want to get diseased from it. You can imagine if all of that was just in real calm water, not moving, mm -hmm. the flies, the maggots, the disease that it would cause, they threw it in a torrential stream so it would wash it out to the Dead Sea. It says they brought out all the uncleanness. All the uncleanness belonged in the brook Kidron. The brook carried all garbage, anything that was abominable to God. And all of that waste was abominable. But I remember in my life, when I got saved, and people, you know, they always ask me, tell me how you got saved, tell me how you got saved. So I'm going to tell you. Uh, I was born Roman Catholic, upstate New York. I'm from Rochester, New York. And uh, I went to Catholic grammar school, and I went to Catholic high school. And I did lost very well. I was a very good lost person. Okay? So in case you, you know, ever wondered, I mean, does this guy really have a testimony? I'll tell you, the testimony is incredible. But um, I used to, I was an engineer. I went to Rochester Institute of Technology. I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. Um, I was into everything. I, all the partying that you could imagine. I was into bodybuilding. I was into to all of that stuff. And now I was a bouncer in the bars. And one night I was bouncing the, at the playpen. So they call me the playpen preacher. And um, I was bouncing at the playpen and uh, I saw this girl. I said, oh, she's really pretty. I need to get to know her. I really get to know her. I had my cowboy hat on too. And, uh, and uh, I went up and introduced myself, and we got to talk, and all one thing led to another, and we started dating, and shortly thereafter, we were married. I didn't really realize this girl was a Christian. She, her family, had just started going to church. She got saved, and then her family moved away to uh, Florida. But she had such a good job, she wanted to stay in Rochester. But she never grew because she was very, very insecure, very, very shy. So she never went to church. After her whole family left, she never went to church. She never grew, but she was a Christian. So she actually agreed to raising our kids Catholic. But she didn't know any better. Sure, we'll raise the kids Catholic. And so, um, you know, we would go out, we would party, listen to the music, drinking like crazy, just having the time of our lives until she got pregnant. She got pregnant. She felt that little kick in her stomach. And uh, one night, in the middle of the night, she woke up bawling. I said, what's the matter? She goes, I can't do it. I can't do what? I can't raise our children Catholic. It's wrong. I know that much. I know it's wrong. I need to start going to church. I go, what? She said, yeah, no, I'm not going to go dancing with you anymore. Uh, and we're not going to listen to that. I'm not going to listen to that music anymore. Uh, I'm not going to drink anymore. I go, what? This is the middle of the night. What a way to get woken up in the middle of the night, knowing that your entire world has just changed because an alien has possessed your wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, we'll talk in the morning. So, you know, she didn't. She didn't go out. I said, I'll go out by myself. Well, when we were on our honeymoon down in St. Thomas, I bought all the top shelf liquor because you can buy it down there really cheap. So I came home with all my top shelf liquor and it was all stored up in the cabinet for very special days. 
One night I had gone out drinking with my buddies, and I came home, and every one of those bottles was empty. <laughs> Poured it down the drain, and then she locked herself in the bedroom. <laughs> and I said, I said, I knew at that moment this is not going to work. And I went in, and I told her, I, mean, I was mad. But I said to her, I said, you preach to me one more time about your Jesus, and you can go right back to your daddy, because I'll be done with you. And guess what happened? She preached to me one more time. And in Baltimore, I put her on the, we were living in Baltimore, and I put her on the airplane, sent her down to her daddy down in Orlando. Daddy picked her up at the airport, went back to the house with her, sat her down on the couch, and said, honey, you married him, now you go back and submit to him. Oh, what father would do that? She came back the next day, and I'll be honest with you, I never told her. I walked into my, our apartment after putting her on that plane, and I dropped to my knees and wept. Mm -hmm. Because it was the first time in my life I felt total emptiness. There was nothing. All good was gone. And uh, she came back. And she submitted to me. Obviously, according to the Lord, I didn't tell her to go kill somebody. But she submitted to me. You ever talk to a dog? What does a dog do when you talk to it? <laughs> That was me. That was me. Every time I did something that was worthy of her getting upset and crazy and going off the deep end, she would just love me. And I'd stand there. I don't get you. You're peculiar. You're strange. You know how it says in the book of Peter, 1 Peter, that a wife can win her husband without the word? By her conversation or behavior, her lifestyle, that's what she was doing. So I had the money. I was traveling all over the world. I had the money. I was in the bodybuilding. You know, I was out there drinking, having a good time with my buddy. But I didn't have what she had. With all that I had, I didn't have what she had. And she had nothing. But she was joyful. And she was happy. She was going to church. So one Sunday she said, you want to go to church with me today? I said, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. I want to see what these people are pumping into your head. So I went to church. I didn't know what to call the pastor because, you know, he wasn't a priest. So I said, Fred, how you doing, Fred? <laughs> that was his name, Fred. <coughs> so I uh, went to church and, you know, my feet got to moving and my knees got to shaking and the gospel was preached and there were things going on and uh, went home the next day there was a knock on the door and I went and I looked in the people and I said to my wife it's them <laughs> it's them did you call them no I didn't call them. it's them it's Fred and his buddy and I said, tell them I'm going running. <clears throat> she said, all right. I went out the back door. I had my jogging suit on. And uh, she opened the door. I said, hey, Pastor, how are you? We came by to visit your husband. Is he at home? I just went out for a jog. And the pastor said, don't worry about it. I'll find him. <laughs> he chased me down in the car. <laughs> this guy was a pencil neck. He looked like Dennis the Menace's father, you know, with beady glasses, skinny little guy. And he's telling this guy that's a bodybuilder running down the road. He pulls up, the back door goes open because the deacon's up front. And he said, get in. I got in. And I've been in ever since. Amen. <laughs> February the 12th, 1984, I trusted Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I was the first Christian in my family in the entire family. And I can tell you that God is good. Amen. Amen. Very good. And he enabled me to prove
preach my mom and dad's funerals in the Catholic Church. Wow. To all my aunts, uncles, cousins, co-workers, neighbors, friends, everybody. They didn't get to hear it just once. They got it twice. And that's how good God is to give yeah. the gospel, not just into me, but into every member of my family. Amen. It's incredible. But I remember on the day that I got saved, February the 12th, 1984, I remember going to the brook to take out all the uncleanness out of the temple. Because this is the temple now. There they cleaned out the temple. Well, this temple needed to be cleaned out as well. And I took my filth that day and I dumped it into the brook. Amen. The porn, the booze, the music. You know, at that point, I didn't know anything about attitudes and stuff. So I just took the, ex the, the, the outward stuff. No smoking, none of that stuff. It's all going in the brook. There were obviously some things easier to get rid of than others. With me, cussing, no problem. No problem. Cussing was done. I don't need to cuss. Okay, it was a little harder with some of the things like booze and all the rest of that. But God got the victory. But it was a, such a blessing to be able to take that stuff to the brook to get rid of it. Amen. Now, let's take a look. Turn your Bible to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 7. The Bible says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now, maybe I'm different. Um, but as a matter of fact, I am different. Ask anybody. But have you ever gone to the bathroom and stood over the toilet crying because you were about to flush your stuff down the toilet? Oh, I can't believe it. We're going to be separated. I'll never see you again. We had such a time together. I, I don't know if I can do it. Please forgive me. That's not how we consider our dumb. You know what dumb is? Dumb is dumb. And Paul says, if I counted more things but dung, it would be so much easier to flush them down. Right. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't want to count them as dung. Why are some of the things that belong in the brook not in the brook? Because we don't look at them as dung. All that garbage and that filth, what God called uncleanness, got thrown into the brook. Why is there still some things in our lives that belong in the brook? Because we don't count them as dumb. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Now look at Second uh, Chronicles uh, chapter 30 with me. Second Chronicles 30. And in verse 8, it says, Now be ye not stiff-necked. <laughs> That's perfect. That's me. As your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. Now look at this. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. You know, some of your convictions grew since the day of your salvation. Things that when you first got saved, you, you, you might have thrown into the brook, okay, but there were probably some things that you didn't really consider that at that point to be something that needed to be discarded. But as you grew in the Lord, your convictions grew, and as the Holy Spirit of God moved, things started mm, to bother you that it was still part of your life. And it's 
That's exactly what happened to me. And as I would grow in the Lord, I said, you know what? I don't need to be part of that anymore. You know what? I don't need to be going to those places anymore. You know what? I even have a problem with my attitude. Now that's my attitude, my lack of forgiveness, my bitterness, my anger. I just don't need to be part of that anymore. And as I grew in the Lord, my family found more and more opportunity to laugh and mock me. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, we'd be sitting around the supper table on Sunday, the, the pasta and the meatballs were all coming out, everybody's digging in, but Paul's over there with his head down, bowing and thanking the Lord for his food, and they make all the comments, Paul fell asleep in his meatballs, and you know, all the rest <laughs> of that, and you know, as you grow in the Lord, you better expect that you're going to receive some mockery. Right. You better expect that you're going to receive some scorn. It go it it goes with the territory. Yeah. Yeah. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution. Shall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It goes along with godly living. The more godly you become, you better expect the mockery and the scorn to come. Don't let it take you by surprise. As a matter of fact, if they don't think you're strange, there's probably something wrong with your Christianity. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now look at verse 11 with me. Nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great congregation. And they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem, and all the altars for incense took they away and cast them into the brook Kidron. Yeah. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed. Ashamed. Christian, there was just a chapter ago, they were taking all this stuff and throwing it into Kidron. Now here, a chapter later, they're taking more stuff. How come it didn't get taken the first time? And you know what it says there? That they were ashamed. They were, when's the last time you were ashamed? When's the last time, sitting under the teaching and preaching of God's word, you were ashamed of yourself? I'll tell you, you know, it's become more and more difficult for us to blush. You know, you drive down the highway now, it's nothing to see an adult entertainment billboard. You know, pull off here, you know, sex toys and all the rest of this. Now you got transgender this and transgender that. Now you've got, you know, abortion. You know, we don't even think about abortion anymore. Abortion, that's been around forever. But when's the last time your sin caused you to be ashamed? When's the last time God convicted you that something belonged in the brook? And you've not yet taken it there. When's the last time you were ashamed? I can tell you that we should be more ashamed than we are. But we live in a Laodicean church age. But Christian, let me tell you something. Just because the rest of the, the, them want to be lukewarm doesn't mean you and I have to be. Amen. There's always a remnant. God's always kept a remnant. Be part of the remnant. Don't be part of the Laodicean Amen. church. Amen. You need to be under the teaching and preaching of God's word. And yes, you know, the, you know, your pastor was saying earlier about the teaching and preaching of God's word. Does it always make you feel good and make you feel fuzzy? Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Two-thirds of those are negative. That's right. Yeah. Reproving and rebuking. Right? One-third of that is a little bit of encouragement. Amen for that. <laughs> But two-thirds is negative. God help us if we come to church going back feeling better about ourselves. Yeah. We can feel better about him. Amen. But feeling better about ourselves should not be our goal. Mm -hmm. They were ashamed. They went back a chapter later and said, man, look at all this other stuff. We, we thought we had thrown everything into the brook. But look at all this other stuff that really needs to go. You know, however long you've been saved, Maybe there's some stuff that still is in your life, that's still in my life, that it really should have been in the brook a long time ago. That God has convicted us of, and 
We just hold on to it because why? We're not ashamed of it. We just hold on to it because of why? We don't look at it as dumb. I mean, if your mother, did your mother ever tell you when you were a kid, go clean your room? Of course she did. And then she would go up to, you'd come downstairs, and you'd say, all done! Right? And then mom would say, I'll check. <laughs> mom goes upstairs, and it's the same, all of you had mothers, and this is what they say, you call this clean? <laughs> and that's what God is saying to us regarding the cleanliness of our temple <clears throat> when it goes to things that really belong in the brook. And you know what God says? You call this clean? Yeah, I can tell you that uh, I remember I was driving down the road with my three kids in the back. My youngest, he was in the car seat. Right in the middle. I could see him right through the rear view mirror. We're driving down the road. He was three years old at the time. Driving down the road, he says, Dad. I said, yes, Luke. I said, what's that? He's pointing a little black box up on the dashboard. I go, oh, that's my radar detector. He says, oh, Dad. Yes, Luke. What's it for? It tells me where police are. Oh. Dad, yes, Luke, why do you want to know where police are? So that I can slow down in time if I'm going too fast. Oh, Dad, yes, Luke, is going too fast sin? <laughs> Amen. And into the brook it went. As our convictions grew, it causes us to have to take more trips back to the brook. So my question to you and to myself, when's the last time you went to the brook? Remember that Bible says that they went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. The inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. The inner part. You know, you've probably thrown your booze in. I'm sure you have. I'm sure you've thrown your cigarettes in. I'm sure you've thrown your pornography in. I'm sure you've, I mean, all that stuff and the cussing and all. But what about the hard attitudes? What about the bitterness? What about the unforgiveness? You hold a grudge against anybody? Is there anybody that you won't apologize to or you won't accept their apology? Mm -hmm. Any bitterness that you might have in your heart at all? You know, the inner part of the house of the Lord. That needs to be cleansed as well. Amen. You know, Jesus said it himself. I know we, we think about booze being really bad and cigarettes being really bad. But wouldn't it Jesus had said it's not what goes into a man that defiles a man? It's what comes out of a man. That defiles the man. Those attitudes. Man, and those are the harder things to get rid of. You know, the, the early stuff, that was easy. But man, those attitudes. And those things can creep up on a daily basis when we allow Mr. Flesh to sit on the throne. Amen. You've got one throne. Two people vying for it, the old man and the new man. It's your choice as to who sit, gets to sit on the throne. Amen. Yeah. I remember growing, you know, in my convictions. I remember because I used to drink beer. So then I went to drink a non-alcoholic beer. Caliber. Drink non-alcoholic, no alcohol, no alcohol. And my buddy walked up to me and said, what are you drinking? So I'm drinking a non-alcoholic beer. I had to define it. And he said, oh, from over there, it looked like the exact same stuff you used to drink. <laughs> One day I was in the church parking lot, and I was listening to music with my windows up. And one of my buddies came over after coming out of church and knocked on the window. He said, I put my window in, what are you listening to? I said, oh, it's Christian music. 
He goes, oh, from over there, I couldn't tell. It sounded like the stuff you used to listen to. <laughs> yeah. As our convictions grow, we got to take more trips to the front. Turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12 and Galatians chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 12 and Galatians chapter 5. Verse we know very well. Hebrews 12, 1. It says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now look at Galatians 5 and verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now, I will tell you that weights are not sins. Weights are exactly what they are. They're weights. They're designed to hold you down, to hold you back. But it's not a sin. That's why the Bible separates them. And the same thing in Galatians 5. Affections aren't necessarily lusts. They're not sins. You have affections and you have lusts. Weights are affections. Lusts are sins. Most, most times you have the lust of the spirit as well. We're talking about most often the lust is speaking of the flesh. So understand, I know when I went to the brook, I carried my sins. Things that God had convicted of me, these are sins. But I never thought about it. Carrying my weights, my affections. I used to like to work out six days a week. I like the Lord on the seventh day of rest. You know, I didn't work out on Sundays. But I'd work out six days a week. But you know what I figured out? That's too much time in the gym. That's too much time. That's not enough time with my kids. That's not enough time with my wife. That's not enough time for ministry. I, I can't be doing this. There's nothing wrong with working out. God wants me to, to be healthy. Bodily exercise does profit little, but it does profit some. <laughs> But you know what it was to me? It was an affection. It was a weight. I had to go over here and cut it back by a third and drop some of those affections into the brook. There might be things in your life. Maybe it's golfing. Maybe it's fishing. I don't know what it is. Hunting. I mean, don't you agree that things have to be in balance? Amen. I mean, what if I street preached eight hours a day, never took my wife on a date, never spent any time with my kids? Street preaching is great. It's a good thing to do. But what about my other responsibilities? Right. We have to keep balance. And sometimes we allow the weights, the affections to hold us back. You are to run a race, right? We are running a race. Now, would you like to race me? In a five-mile race, uh, one-mile race, <laughs> holding a 20-pound weight in each hand. You have to hold the weights. I get to run free. Those weights are holding back, keeping you from being the best that you can be, to run the best race you can run. That's why it says, let us lay aside the weights and the sins. Lay aside a weight. Lay aside an affection. Yeah. I mean, anything can become an idol. Even good things. Right. Even good things. Think about uh, grandkids. Isn't it great to have grandkids come over and see them leave? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, grandkids, uh, it could be, it could be, uh, maybe you like reading. And, you're, you're, and, you know, you read all day long. There's nothing wrong with reading and expanding your mind. But is it? holding you back from running the race you should be running. Are there things keeping you out of church? I got a promotion. This is great. Yeah, it's work. It's good to work. The Bible says we should work or we should meet. But if you work, 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 seven days a week all the time, such that you're never in church, you're never able to fellowship with God's people, you're never even able to be with your own families because you're working all the time, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Amen. You need to go to the brook. Put a few of those things where they belong. Yeah. 
the weights and the sins, Christian. Because I will not be brought under the power of any. Let me give you a good example of this so you can really understand what I'm trying to say as far as affections. If I want to look up and behold the stars, I'm not going to go into downtown Manhattan and look up. Because all I'm going to see is lights. The interference of lights. Are those lights sinful? No. But they're interfering with my primary objective. All the other light is distracting me from seeing the light I set out to see, which was the stars. If I want to see the stars, I'm going to go out in the middle of the country. Nobody around. No other lights to interfere so that I can get the most beautiful picture of heavenly lights. And that's the same thing with affections in our lives. We allow them to weigh us down. We allow them to keep us from running the race that we should be running. Some of those things should be in the brook. And that's between you and the Lord. But you know, as I was uh, thinking about it, I said, those blood-stained river banks, I said, that's an interesting name is a bank. I said, you know, you can do two things at a bank. You can deposit money and you can withdraw money. And I just wonder how many of us have been back to the brook to make a withdrawal, <laughs> not a deposit. What do you mean, preacher? Well, now because you're so mature and you know the Bible so well and you can find the verses you need to support what you want to do, there's nothing wrong with going back and just taking out some of those old movies that have cuss words in them. I mean, I mean they've even put some of those cuss words in the, in the dictionary now. My goodness, it's like common language today. So maybe some of those things that they convicted me 20 years ago, but I'm not so convicted about them anymore. I can handle a few cuss words in my movies now. Yeah, I remember well, me and my boys like to, used to like to watch John Wayne movies. And uh, I had a real conviction about cussing when I first got saved. And not that I don't now. Okay, relax. Um, <laughs> but I, I had one of those beta machines, like a VHS, but it was a beta. And every time I'd be watching the movie and every time a cuss word came up, when my boys weren't around, it's just me and the machine, I'd hit the record button and go over that cuss word with, ah, you know, it would record over the top of it. So my boys would come in to watch the movie, and it was, and he couldn't understand anything. He said, Dad, you've ruined the movie. I should have just taken Big Jake over to the brook and just dropped it in. And Christian, let's face it, uh, some of us, our convictions have weakened. That's why, why do you think we're called Laodicean? Why is this a Laodicean church age? Do you know what they used to do in the old days? Deacons used to walk up and down the aisles with a long rod. And if you fell asleep in church, pop! <laughs> How many of you would still be here if someone did that to you? But they did it back in the old days and it was acceptable and they took it. Because you're right, I shouldn't be falling asleep in church. Rather than being offended, I'm going down the street to the other church where Joel preaches. <laughs> he never says anything bad about people because his ministry is to encourage. He only preaches from the happy text. Yeah. Would you would you take it? <coughs> I ask myself these questions. Would I take it? Would I take it? But there's things that I took. I'm going to tell you, there's things I took out of the brook. I remember. Got saved in Maryland. And we all go through this. And started to struggle in my walk with the Lord. And started to backslide. And I was living in Maryland at the time. I was about one year saved, maybe two years saved. And I told my wife, I said, we're moving back to New York. And I didn't tell her this, but it was because I knew God didn't live in New York. So 
the conviction would be less. Mm. I went back to New York, went and started hanging out with my old buddies again, all my college buddies, start going out again, start partying again. The joy wasn't there like it used to be, but still, I was running. I remember telling my buddies, I said, hey, let's go see my brother up in L.A. Let's go, let's go visit Rick. Okay, we hopped the plane. We didn't tell Rick we're coming. We flew out there to L.A. We were out in Manhattan Beach drinking. You know, it was probably 10 o'clock at night, sitting there drinking, just having the time of our lives. And I remember sitting there holding a the beer, and I was drinking it. A teenage boy walked up to me. He said, sir, can I please share the gospel with Jesus Christ with you? Rick. And I just, no thank you. And I went back to drinking, just covering it up, just covering it up. The next morning we got up, we went down to Redondo Pier, we all had Coronas, we were drinking at eight o'clock in the morning, oh, this is cool, we're out in the sunshine. I remember walking back off the pier, it must have been an 80 year old woman sitting in a wheelchair. She said, sir, can I please share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you? And I broke started falling. Got on the phone, told my wife I'm coming home. <clears throat> I've, done, I've done wrong. I've done wrong. I went to the brook. I made a withdrawal. And I, I need to go back and I need to redeposit. Mm -hmm. And I'm so sorry. I said I'm sorry to my wife, but more than that, I'm sorry to the Lord, my testimonies, my friends, and all the rest. And it's because I went back to the brook to make a withdrawal. How many times have we done it? Whether it be our music, whether it be our movies, whether it be our clothing, whether it be our attitudes, stuff that used to be in the inner part of the heart, inner part of the house that got thrown in years ago. And then we could life, life comes and life is hard. And life beats us up a little bit. And then we feel like we have a right to be bitter against God. Then the preacher says something when you're in that state and, you know, all of a sudden you're looking for another church. You know, it's all because we went back to the brook and took out something that had been deposited years ago. But you know, we don't always go back for folly. Sometimes we go back because it's familiar. Remember in John chapter 21, after Peter denied the Lord three times, it says, I go a fishing. The Lord had called him to be a fisher of men. He went back to fishing for fish. You know the sad part of that? It says, and the others went with him. You're being watched. Don't think you're not being watched. No man is an island. No man is an island. No woman is an island. You're being watched. There are people that care. There are people that are looking for hope. I remember one time I told my brother, hey, let's go out drinking. And I was saved at that time. And he knew I was saved. And he said, no, don't do it. I go, why? He goes, just don't go do it. It wasn't because of me. He saw hope in me. He saw something in me that was different. He was like that dog with a head cock. He saw something. I was, I was living a more peculiar life up until that point. And I said, hey, let's go out drinks. He said, no, don't do it. Because any hope I have right now is because of you. And Christian, when we go back and we make withdrawals out of the brook, there are people watching. There are people going with us. And how did they find Peter on the boat? Naked. Not in exactly the best way I would want the Lord to find me. Amen? Amen. When's the last time you went to the brook? Yeah. I know we say we're more mature now. We can handle it, etc., etc., etc. That's not true. It's not true at all. Well, one of the things that, you know, King Asa, his mother was queen, and uh, she had an idol. And before Asa took the idol and threw it to the brook Kidron, he said, I'm going to burn it first. This way, when I throw it in, I can't go. and Nobody can go and make a withdrawal. <laughs> That's something. Don't take your old movies and your old music and all that stuff. 
stuff and your booze or whatever, whatever. Don't take it upstairs to the closet or into the attic. Get rid of that stuff because it's more likely that you're going to go and make a withdrawal at some point. The last point I want to make to you. Um, and as far as repentance, before I go to the last point, you might be far away from the Lord right now. I don't know, because I don't know you folks. There's four different ways in which to measure your standing in Christ. You can compare yourself to the world. You can say, I'm an arm's distance from the world. And as the world keeps floating, and you just maintain your arm's distance, you feel like you're okay, because I'm still an arm's distance away from the world. But the world's going to keep moving, as we know. That's why the church has moved. There's another way to compare yourself, and that's to each other. I'm not as bad as Brother Bill. I know what Brother Bill does. I don't do that. There's a third way. You can compare yourself to who you used to be. Well, I, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not what I used to be. Fourth way is to compare yourself to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And that is the way that we need to be measuring ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way. No, now, no matter how far you've gotten from God, let's say that you and God were right here at one point, and man, you are way over here now. And you say, man, for me to get back to where I used to be, I don't know how I could possibly do it. It's going to be so difficult. You know what the Bible says? It says, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto thee. Every step I take toward him, he takes a step toward me. So guess where I meet him? In the middle. The distance back is only half as far as how far I travel away. Because he comes and meets me. Like the prodigal, the father ran to me. No matter how far you've gotten away, you can go back to the brook. It's probably only half as far away as, as you've gotten from it. I'm going back and redeposit some things that need to be in there. Maybe a first time deposit of things that have never been put in there. But the one thing we all need to be convicted about, myself included, is when we go back and we make withdrawals. The things that at one point in our life used to be a conviction. The last point I want to make, turn your Bible to John chapter 18. You know what I like about GPS? If you make a wrong turn, it recalculates <laughs> and gets you back on track. And that's what the Lord does for us. Yeah, you. I wanted you to go right there. But since you didn't go right, go another mile down the road and make a right there. Isn't that nice? And the Lord does that. He's so gracious. So no matter how far you've gotten, no matter how many things belong in the brook and you haven't taken them, he'll redirect you. Amen. John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook, that's Kidron in the New Testament, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. That's the garden of Gethsemane. And that garden was on the other side of the brook, Kidron. And there was only one way to get, for those disciples to get into that garden, they go into that garden with Jesus Christ. There is a garden waiting for us on the other side that only Jesus Christ can get you into. Right. Not your good works, not your baptism, not your church membership, not reading the Bible, not your denomination, your affiliations, whether grandpa was a preacher, whatever the case, none of that will matter. Except the man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. Remember, Brook Kidron was a place of filth. You know how I got into that garden on February the 12th, 1984? I put, I allowed Jesus Christ to take all my filth, throw it into the brook. I exchanged my righteousness for his righteousness. Amen. All of my righteousnesses were as filthy rags. They went into the brook. He then took me over the brook into a place called the garden. And there's a garden waiting for all those that have trusted Jesus Christ, their personal Lord and Savior. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ and you've never exchanged your righteousness for 
his righteousness, you haven't accepted that free gift of salvation, you'll never see that garden. You'll never see that garden. And the only way to enter that garden is your righteousness has to go into the brook because your righteousness is filthy. And then take on his righteousness, which is perfect and holy. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You want to enter that garden? you got to do it with him. You can't do it. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Amen. Amen. So we have a couple things here today, folks. We have the deposits that need to be made into the brook. We have the withdrawals that are made out of the brook. For those that need salvation, you need to get over the brook. I don't know what the Lord is doing. I don't know what he's doing in your life. I just know that this is a message he heavily laid on my heart. Especially with some of the examples I gave you of things I took out of the brook. When's the last time you were there? What was the purpose for which you went? Preacher, all yours. Amen. Uh, let's uh, let's stand, and we're going to turn over to one fifty six, and we're going to sing "Is Your All on the Altar." And if you're here today, and the Lord has spoken to your heart about something in regards to making a deposit in that brook, then I invite you to come to this altar and talk to the Lord about it. Leave it there. And place it on the altar and let God have it. And you discard it. If that's your case this morning, I hope that you'll do that. And if you're not saved this morning, I hope that you will trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and be sure that you're saved. We don't have the piano this morning, so we're going to sing it. We're going to sing it as you're all on the altar. And you all, if you will, let's sing. And if you need to come, I invite you to come. Altar's open. I hope that you will. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you can
if you don't come to the altar, then at least where you're at, do some business with the Lord. Amen? Amen. And if you don't do it now, make sure before this day is over with. Don't let the sun, don't let the sun go down. Amen? Yeah. Until you've taken care of it. Let's sing his third verse. And think, not everything, just and there's one thing God's dealing with you about. Oh, we never can know what the Lord will be so of the blessings for which we have prayed. Heal our body and soul, He doth fully control, and our all on the altar is laid. Here's your own on the altar of sacrifice laid. Your heart does the Spirit